everyone, welcome back to my channel, I'm Huck. Today we are talking about my best books of 2020, my favorite books of the year. Um, this is always, of course, a fun video to do because it's just talking about the things that I loved most that I read in 2020. So I have five favorites to talk about and two honorable mentions. So let's get started first up with my two honorable mentions, which are both by the same author, which are Strange Grace and Lady Hotspur, both by Tessa Grattan. So first up, I'm going to talk about Lady Hotspur. This is an adult fantasy that is set in the same world as The Queens of Innis Lear, which was one of my favorite books in 2019. This is an adult high fantasy retelling of Shakespeare's Henry IV Part One. I think. I think it's part one. Um, but this is set about a hundred years after the events of the Queens of Innis Lear. And in this we are following multiple perspectives, but the three main perspectives are three lady knights. One of them is Prince Hal, whose mother has re recently led a rebellion to take over uh, the country. And so Hal, who has been a knight, um, has now been thrust into this position of being a prince and she's not really, doesn't feel prepared for it and prepared for that kind of responsibility. Uh, one of the other knights is Banamora, who was previously the prince of this country and is no longer. And then finally is Lady Hotspur, who has this like star-crossed lovers whirlwind romance with Prince Hal. And their romance is very central to this story and they kind of end up on opposite sides of this conflict. Now this one I did not love quite as much as The Queens of Innis Lear, which is why this is a honorable mention and not one of my like top five favorites of the year, but I still really loved this. I love this world that Tessa Grattan has constructed. Um, in this, this takes place partially on Innis Lear, which is this magical island, and partially in another country, which I forget the name of, but it is a less magical country. Um, but I, I just love the world in general, but especially the parts that are on Innis Lear because it does feel so magical. It has this beautiful like nature atmosphere and nature magic to it, um, where there are characters who are able to communicate with the trees and they read star prophecies and all of this. Tessa Grattan's writing is also absolutely beautiful and creates such atmosphere that I just love the feel of reading this book. She also creates characters that I just get so attached to, especially in this world of Innis Lear. Um, one of my now like favorite characters of all time is from this book and he just is so sweet and just too good for this world <laughs> and I love him so much. Um, and so I just adored this. There were a few things that made this a honorable mention instead of a favorite of the year, uh, one of which is that with the romance between um, Lady Hotspur and Prince Hal. I, I enjoyed their romance, I liked both of their characters, and I liked them together, but there wasn't a lot of build-up to their romance. It was definitely like love at first sight. I don't know if I would necessarily call it insta-love, but it was like a love at first sight. They, these two lady knights like see each other across a battlefield and fall in love, and it just becomes this very like intense whirlwind romance right away, um, which I could definitely see some people enjoying that, and there is definitely a lot of like intensity and angst to their romance and as I said I enjoyed the two of them together. I just am somebody that I love the build-up to a relationship and it's a little harder for me to feel fully invested in a romance if I don't get to have a little more time spent in the build-up stages of that romance and because their romance is so central to the plot in this, you have to be very, like, you have to buy into their romance and be very invested in it to, like, fully buy into the story. So that was something that just fell a little short for me. Um, and then also there were some things about the ending that I didn't love. In general, I think that the ending, and I really liked how it ended, but there's just an ending for one particular character that I really didn't like and kind of like soured the ending for me a little bit. Um, but I still just 
love reading Tessa Grattan's books and her characters and her writing and being in this world so I wanted to definitely talk about this one. Then of course the other honorable mention is Strange Grace also by Tessa Grattan. This is a standalone YA fantasy um, that is set in a small village that is on the edge of a forest that they call the Devil's Wood or the Devil's Forest um, and generations back the people of this village made a deal with the devil that lives in the forest that every I think seven years when the slaughter moon rises they will sacrifice the best boy in the town to the forest and to the devil and in exchange the devil protects this village from any blight, weather, sickness, pretty much anything. Um, but at the beginning of the story the slaughter moon has risen early and nobody knows why and so they're unprepared for this, they don't know who they're going to be sacrificing as the saint um, and they have to kind of scramble to figure out like what's going to happen and they're also trying to figure out like if something has gone wrong with their deal and if you know they're suddenly not going to have this kind of protection that they've had for so many years. And we're following three main characters who are best friends, one of which is Merwin who is a witch and the daughter of like the local witch who uh, kind of handles the rituals around this deal with the devil. Then there's also Run who is kind of the golden boy of this village and everyone expects that he is going to be the sacrificial saint because he is the best boy in the village. And then finally there is Arthur who is kind of an outcast and is very like angry and he wants to prove himself to the town or to the village and so he wants to be the sacrificial saint. And so all three of them kind of have different uh, connections to this ritual and to this sacrifice. Um, and then when the day of the sacrifice comes things don't go exactly as planned and they find out um, some secrets of like how what the sacrifice really means what the how the deal really works um, and kind of the repercussions of not doing the ritual sacrifice exactly as it has been for generations and once again I love Tessa Grattan's writing. It is always beautiful and atmospheric and atmospheric writing is something that just always gets me especially because she does such a beautiful nature atmosphere. This one has definitely a darker tone to it because it has this like ritualistic sacrifice and this devil in the woods and there is this like dark magic in the forest. There's some elements of body horror in this of like the forest kind of mutilating people's bodies and things like that. Um, but I just, the the atmosphere of it is just so excellent. Now one of the book's weaknesses is that it doesn't have the strongest plot. This is definitely not a book that is read for the plot. The book is like 90% vibes. I had a great time with it because I was totally just like coasting on vibes for this and like loving it. Um, but yeah, the plot is not the strongest point in this book. The characters in this, I personally really loved them because they are character tropes that I generally enjoy and are character tropes that I know Tessa Grattan has written similar types of characters in other books. So they're ones that I'm very familiar with from other books that I've read and from reading other books by Tessa Grattan specifically. So I felt very attached to them, but they also are not characters that are have necessarily like the most depth to them. Um, so I could see why maybe other people wouldn't feel as connected to them. So I guess that's kind of to explain why this maybe made it onto the honorable mentions list and not a favorite, but I still just enjoyed this one so much and I love the atmosphere of it. Now we can get into my top five favorites of 2020 and for this I decided that I'm going to just talk about them in the order that I read them because I don't really want to try and rank them. I don't want to compare them. Um, a lot of these I just I don't feel like they even have enough in common necessarily to compare them adequately. So 
We're just going to talk about them in the order that I read them. So that means that first up, my first book is Mem by Bethany C. Morrow. This is a adult speculative novella that is set in an alternate history 1920s Montreal where they have developed a type of technology that can remove memories from people's minds and when that memory is removed it becomes what is called a mem and a mem is kind of like a duplicate of the person that had this memory and but this mem is just living that memory on loop over and over. They're not able to have thoughts outside of that memory or uh, create new memories. And so the mems are kind of kept in what is called the vault, which is where um, they do these procedures and then also where they keep the mems. Uh, but in this, our main character is a mem who is not like the other mems because she is able to create new memories. And so she's pretty much able to live like a regular person. And for the last few years, she's been living pretty much a normal life with some supervision from the like scientists from the vault. Um, but she's pretty much been living a normal life when at the beginning of the story, uh, she is recalled back to the vault. And so she's trying to figure out why she's been recalled, is there like a problem with this memory technology, um, and then also she's still trying to figure out like who is she and why is she different from all of these other mems and what does it mean to be a living memory that belongs to somebody else and having memories that aren't from your own life. Um, and I just adored this book. I feel like I talked about this book so much in 2020 because um, I was so excited about it. But I just think that it just it did so many things so excellently. Um, of course, it's about memory, which is a theme that I have discovered in 2020 that I really love in books. And this is one of the books that kind of made me realize that memory is a theme that I'm particularly interested in in books. It talks about how our memories are a part of us and they form us and how we learn and mature through different experiences, but also kind of goes through different reasons why people would want to remove memories and the reasons that people make those choices and then the impact of those choices. And it doesn't give like a black or white answer as to whether it's good or bad to remove these memories because for some people the choice might better their lives and for some people it might worsen their lives. Um, but I just really loved its exploration of memory and the impact of being able to remove memories and how our memories like are so integral to ourselves and our understanding of the world and our lives and our own identity. And it did all of that in under 200 pages. It made me care about the main character in under 200 pages, which for me, like I'm usually like a long book kind of person and it takes me a little while to really care about a character. But I just think that so many parts of this book were so excellently crafted and I absolutely adored it. Next is Get a Life Chloe Brown by Talia Hibbert. This is an adult contemporary romance, which I think this is the first time I have had a romance on my favorite books of the year, but I think it's only fitting since in 2020 I read more romance than I think I ever have in a single year in my life. Um, and this was definitely my favorite one that I read in 2020. So this in this we are following our main character Chloe Brown, who is chronically ill, um, and at the beginning of the story she has a near-death experience which is not related to her chronic illness. I think she's almost hit by a car um, and her life flashes before her eyes and she decides that she thinks she's been living her life too carefully and that she wants to get a life. And so what she does is she makes herself a get a life list, uh, which includes things like moving into her own place, um, doing something bad, riding a motorcycle, things like that. And so first thing she does is move out of her family home and get her own apartment. And it just so happens that the superintendent of the apartment complex is this guy who is a very attractive artist who rides a motorcycle. And the two of them butt heads at the beginning, but eventually she enlists him to help her check things off from her get a life list and eventually they fall for each other. And this book was just so 
fun to read. Um, this was one of the first like contemporary romances that I read that year or last year. Um, but it was just so much fun. I liked both of the characters so much. They just seemed like really genuine people who were trying their best. I felt like, you know, there's always a certain degree of drama in romances, but this one just didn't feel overly dramatic in a way that was like overly contrived. I just felt like the people felt very genuine, the romance felt very genuine, and I really just felt like it was two people who were just trying their best and even when they had problems they were trying to work through them in the best way that they could and I just loved them so much and this one just gave me all the like heart fluttery warm fuzzy feelings that I would ever want out of a contemporary romance and I just loved it. Next up is Cemetery Boys by Aidan Thomas. This is a YA contemporary fantasy that is following a family of Bruhex, and in this family they have a gendered magic system in which the men of the family have one type of magic and the women of the family have another type of magic, and our main character in this is Yadriel, who is a trans boy um, whose fa his family is not letting him do the ritual that is necessary in order to use the magic uh, because they don't believe that it will work for him because he's trans and so he decides to take matters into his own hands. Um, but at the beginning of the story his cousin dies mysteriously and Yadriel decides to help his family figure out what happened to his cousin and he's hoping that along the way he will be able to prove to his family that he is really a brujo. Um, but he accidentally summons the wrong ghost which happens to be the ghost of a boy named Julian who went to school with Yadriel and the two of them are very opposite from one another but they decide to work together to help Julian figure out what happened to him and also tie up some loose ends from his life and then to help Yadriel figure out what happened to his cousin. But then as they are working together and spending more time together they start to fall for each other. And this book just had such lovable characters. I just I loved all of them so much. Um, I especially of course loved Yadriel and Julian and their dynamic together. They are definitely opposites but I think that they balance each other really well and I really liked the way that that kind of having these like opposite characters worked in their relationship because sometimes in books that sort of opposites attract uh, trope just creates excess drama but in this one I think it really served to help the characters grow and balance each other and they just worked so well together because they were opposites and I loved how they balanced each other like that. I think also what's great about these two characters is that even though they are very different in a lot of ways, they're really able to understand each other and see each other. They kind of see each other's truest selves in a way that other people in their lives don't see them um, and that really helps, you know, create this bond between them and they're both just such endearing characters that I loved so much. This also had some really interesting family dynamics to it, especially for Yadriel and his relationship with his family um, and their, you know, understanding and acceptance of him and him being trans because they're kind of varying degrees of understanding and acceptance with different, you know, family members that he has. And I just thought that that you know, was really interesting to see and I really liked how um, individual the family dynamics were. And this is just one that like warmed my heart and as I said these characters were just so endearing and I loved them so much. Next up is A Dance with Fate by Juliet Marillier. Uh, this is the second book in her Warrior Bards trilogy which is an ongoing series and this is an adult historical fantasy that is set in early medieval Ireland um, and in this we are following three young warriors. In the first book they were all uh, vying for a spot on Swan Island which is this island that trains elite warriors and in this one we are following the same three young warriors. Two of them are still on Swan Island and one of them is kind of off doing his own thing somewhere else. Um, but at the beginning of the story 
uh, Levon and Dao, who are still on Swan Island, get into a training accident in which Dao gets a head injury that causes him to go blind. And so he is sent back to his family home uh, to either recuperate from this injury or to continue living there. And Levon goes with him for one year as a bond servant, kind of as service because she was involved in the accident. Um, but Dao has a very complicated, dark and like traumatic uh, past with his family. So he really doesn't want to go back to his family home. And so when they get there, he has to confront um, some of his past like traumas from living there. Uh, but they also find out that some a lot of things have changed since he has been there last and that there might be some secrets and some darker things going on beneath the surface. I have really been enjoying this series, but this second book I just loved even more than the first one. I think a lot of that is because I felt like this one got much more into the characters. For Dao's character, we get to find out more about his past and he has a lot of inner turmoil that he's dealing with because he has to confront things from his past and then also is dealing with this new injury and being blind and how that affects his life. Um, for Levon, I just think we got to know her a lot better and her character and she's just like such a good friend that I just feel like I appreciated her character so much more in this. Um, and I think that just for so something about the premise of this one really worked for me also. Of course, I always love Juliet Marillier's writing and the atmosphere and just how beautifully she writes nature and how she writes characters and relationships. There is a relationship in this series that is like a rivals to friends to lovers slow burn that I just love. I think that she does slow burn romances so well. There are just so many things about this that I absolutely adored and this is one that I just didn't want to put down. Not because it is like action packed or fast paced but because I was just so invested in everything that was happening and just in love with these characters and being in this story that I just didn't want to be apart from it. And then last but not least, I actually have an entire series, which is the Ember in the Ashes series by Shaba Tahir. I only have physically the first two books here, but this is a YA fantasy series that is set in a militaristic Roman inspired world um, where we're following at least in the first book we're following two main perspectives. One of them is Laia who at the beginning of the story uh, her brother is arrested for treason and she wants to save him but her only resource is contacting this like lo the local rebels and so she gets involved with this rebel group which they agree that if she will spy for them at this military academy then they will help her to free her brother. And so she gets put into this extremely dangerous uh, situation spying at this elite military academy. While she is there, she crosses path with, paths with our other main character, which is Elias, who is kind of top of his class at this military academy. He's very soon to graduate, but he's actually planning to run away because he does not want to be a mask, which are these like elite soldiers that are trained at the academy. And the story starts out smaller where it's focusing on these two characters, their personal problems, and also trying to free Laia's brother. And then over the course of the series, it really expands into this larger, like, you know, life or death for countries in the world and struggle between like humanity and the magical djinn. And as the series goes on, we also get more um, character perspectives as well. And one of the things that I liked so much about this series is that the place where it starts and the place where it ends are just so different. I love books or series that you can't you wouldn't have known from where you start where you would have ended and you can't really explain where it's going from where it starts and I just love that about this. I really liked the characters in this and I think that one of the things that I really especially liked about this was that it did feel very high stakes throughout the series. I think this book or this series goes a little bit darker than I was expecting for a YA. Um, 
the author really isn't afraid to hurt characters or kill characters off. And there are so many times in this where I really believed that characters, even main characters, could be irreparably harmed um, or even killed. And I just, I loved that it really felt high stakes in that way. Like I really believed that things could happen. In this series, the second book, A Torch Against the Night, I think was definitely my favorite one. But overall, I just loved this series and I just like felt when I was reading these books, I felt like I couldn't put them down. So those are my favorite books of 2020. I would love to know what was one of your favorite books of the year. Thank you all for watching and until next time, bye!